humanity. So should we all just take poison now and be done with it? Some people think that evolutionary psychology claims to have discovered that human nature is selfish and wicked, but they are flattering the researchers and anyone who would claim to have discovered the opposite. No one needs a scientist to measure whether humans are prone to knavery. Uh, the question has been answered in the history books, the newspapers, the ethnographic record, and the letters to Ann Landers. But people treat it like an open question, as if someday science might discover that it's all a bad dream, and we will wake up to find that it is human nature to love one another. The task of evolutionary psychology is not to weigh in on human nature, a task better left off to other disciplines. It is to add the satisfying kind of insight that only science can provide, to connect what we know about human nature with the rest of our knowledge of how the world works, and to explain the largest number of facts with the smallest number of assumptions. Already, a large part of our social psychology, while well documented in the lab and the field, can be shown to fall out of a few assumptions about kin selection, parental investment, reciprocal altruism, and the computational theory of mind. Uh, so does human nature doom us to a nightmare of exploitation by ruthless fitness maximizers? Again, it's silly to look to science for the answer. Everyone knows that people are capable of monumental kindness and sacrifice. The mind has many components and accommodates not only ugly motives, but love, friendship, cooperation, a sense of fairness and ability to predict the consequences of our actions. Uh, the different parts of the mind struggle to engage or disengage, a clutch pedal of behavior, so bad thoughts do not always cause bad deeds. Jimmy Carter, in his famous Playboy interview, said, quote, I have looked on a lot of women with lust. I have committed adultery in my heart many times, end quote. But of course, the prying American press has found no evidence that he has committed it in real life, even once. And of course, um, you know, Jimmy Carter was extremely religious. And on the larger stage, history has seen terrible blights disappear permanently, uh, sometimes only after years of bloodshed, sometimes as if in a puff of smoke. Slavery, Harlem holding despots, colonial conquest, blood feuds, and women as property, institutionalized racism and anti-Semitism, child labor, uh, fascism, Stalinism, Leninism, and war have vanished from expanses of the world that had suffered them for decades, centuries, or even millennia. The homicide rates in the most vicious American urban jungles are 20 times lower than in many foraging societies. Modern Britons are 20 times less likely to be murdered than their medieval ancestors. If the brain has not changed over the centuries, how can the human condition have improved? Part of the answer, I think, is that literacy, knowledge, and the exchange of ideas have undermined some kinds of exploitation. It's not that people have a well of goodness that moral exhortations can tap. It is that information can be framed in a way that makes exploiters look like hypocrites or fools. One of our baser instincts, claiming authority on a pretext of benef uh, bene benefic beneficence and competence, can be cunningly turned on the others. When everyone sees graphic representations of suffering, it is no longer possible to claim that no harm has been done. When a victim gives a first-person account in words, the victimizer might use, it's harder to maintain that the victims are a lesser kind of being. When a speaker is shown to be echoing the words of his enemy or of a past speaker whose policies led to disaster, his authority can crumble. When peace, peaceable neighbors are described, it's harder to insist that war is inevitable. When Martin Luther King Jr. said, quote, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out of the true meaning of its creed, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, end quote. He made it impossible for segregationists to maintain they were patriots without looking like charlatans. And as I mentioned at the outset, though conflict is a human universal, so are efforts to reduce it. The human mind occasionally catches a glimmering of the brute economic fact that often uh, adversaries can both come out ahead by dividing up the surplus created by their laying down their arms. Even some of the uh, Yanomamo cultures see the futility of their ways and long for a means to break the cycle of vengeance. People throughout history have invented ingenious technologies that turn one part of the mind against another, and several increments of civility from a human nature that was not selected for niceness. Rhetoric, uh, 
contracts, deterrence, equal opportunity, meditation, courts, enforceable laws, monogamy, limits on economic inequality, abjuring vengeance, and many others. Utopian uh, theoreticians uh, thought to be humble in the face of this practical wisdom is likely to remain more effective than cultural proposals to make over child rearing language and the media and biological proposals to scan the brains and genes of gang members for aggression in the amygdala, for example, or markers uh, and of that nature and to hand out anti-violence pills in the ghettos. And so, um, Tenzin uh, Gayatso, the Dalai Lama of Tibet, uh, was identified at the age of two as the 14th reincarnation of the Buddha, of compassion, holy, lord, gentle, glory, eloquent, compassionate, learned, defender of the faith, ocean of wisdom. Uh, he was taken to Lhasa, Lhasa, no, and yeah, and brought up by um, monks who tutored him in philosophy, medicine, and metaphysics. In 1950, he became the spiritual and secular leader in exile of the Tibetan people. Despite not having a power base, he is recognized as a world statesman on the sheer force of his moral authority, and in 1989 was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. No human being could be more predisposed by his upbringing and by the role he has been thrust into to have pure and noble thoughts. In 1993, an interviewer for the New York Times asked him about himself. He said that, as a boy, he loved war toys, especially his air rifle. As an adult, he relaxes by looking at battlefield photographs and had just ordered a 30-volume Time Life Illustrated History of World War II. Like people everywhere, he enjoys studying pictures of military hardware like tanks, airplanes, warships, U-boats, submarines, and especially aircraft carriers. And of course, that's uh, normal for most males. Uh, he has erotic dreams and finds himself attracted to beautiful women, often having to remind himself I am a monk. Uh, none of this has stood in the way of his being one of history's great pacifists, and despite the oppression of his people, he remains an optimist and predicts that the 21st century will be more peaceful than the 20th. Why? asked the interviewer. He said, because I believe, he said, that in the 20th century, humanity has learned something from many, many experiences, some positive and many negative. What misery, what destruction. The greatest number of human beings were killed in the two world wars of this century. But human nature is such that when we face a tremendous critical situation, the human mind can wake up and find some other alternative. That is a human capacity. End quote. And as you have heard it, from 1993 interview for the New York Times asking Tenzin Gayatso, the Dalai Lama of Tibet. Um, he was at the age um, of two when he became the 14th reincarnation of the Buddha.